Hello everyone and welcome back to PAX and Recreation, Cowboys Edition. And today we continue the saga with another collector booster box from Outlaws at Thunder Junction. So, as promised in, on, <laughs> on previous episodes of PAX and Recreation, we said that the next time we open a collector booster box, we will talk about the story of Outlaws at Thunder Junction. And if you are a story savvy person for MTG, you will be thinking, what story? And that, my friend, is the right approach. <laughs> what story is there in Outlaws of Thunder Junction? Well, the main thing that happens is right there in the booster. So Kellyan found his father, Oko, finally. Oko is just chilling here in the cowboy's plane for some reason. And Ooh, get off the flesh right. Okay. And they just want to do... By the way, just if you're new to this, we're going to mix them. Ooh, mana drain, let's go! Uh, and <laughs> we are just going to... See, this is the thing with magic. Uh, mini, mini pause here. This is the thing with magic. Mana drain is an expensive card. I don't particularly like this art, to be honest. I prefer the normal one, but hey. I take my chances. This is an expensive card, powerful card. Why is it a powerful card? It costs two. It's a blue spell, in case you can tell because of the... And it's a counter spell. At the beginning of your next main phase, add an amount of colorless mana equal to that spell's mana value. So, it is freaking good. No counters, or at least no, no down effects. And it even gives you mana. So this is freaking amazing. There is a reason why this thing hasn't been printed again. And well, there are two. One is power balancing and two is secondary market. Now, they decided to reprint this here of all sets. And this is the thing with Magic the Gathering. So Magic the Gathering is a scam, <laughs> but like basically it's gambling, right? It's gacha boxes. And I am the first person to defend that, hey, if you need a card or two or three and your playgroup is okay with it, just proxy the freaking thing. Like, no one cares. If Even more if it's an old card, because you can't buy it legally from Wizards of the Coast. Like, they don't sell it unless it's in a secret layer, which now they make the secret layers limited. So, like, there is less and less time to get it. So if you, you can't buy it legally from Wizards and you just need to, need it to test it or just for your 100 cards deck that you already paid for uh, and all those cards are legal, like, just proxy one. Like, no one cares. Like, you, you, you're giving the money to secondary market is not benefiting, benefiting Wizards in any way. Well, it does in the sense that they... Whenever Wizards does a card that is designed specifically to buzz at the secondary market because it's expensive and or powerful and has uh, very few quantities, etc. Well, the secondary market just goes cray cray. But all this to say, this, this is a type of card that proves that even though it's kind of bull that you need to buy boosters or buy cards and there is like a pay to win thing here, unless, for example, in Commander, which is what anyone plays anyways, um, you need to, like the best thing you can do is agree on a price. Like, oh, okay, no decks higher than 300 bucks or something like that if you're using proxies, or even if you're not using proxies, because otherwise it's pay to win. But what happens if you remove the limits and say, okay, full proxies, no limits, final destination. That, that becomes CD, CEDH, so competitive commander. And what happens in competitive commander? Everyone plays the same seven decks because that's the most optimal thing. And even though I agree with it, like you should always play optimal, if there was no limit as to how you get the cards. Everyone will play with the same cards because it's the optimal strategy. Now, I know what you may be thinking because I have a friend that really drills down this, uh, this perspective. If the game is designed like that, then the game is not well designed. If, if, you, if you can pay to win and if you had access to every single card, suddenly everyone plays with the same because it's optimal, similar to what happens with Pokemon, uh, the competitive Pokemon, if you're playing Pokemon Showdown on, like, the video game, not the card game. No one no one plays the card game, right? <laughs> dun, 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 dun. So, um, what happens is that everyone plays with the same Pokemon, because that's the meta. And with Magic, well, that's the meta, pretty much. Like, 
there is a reason why people just keep using TAS as Oracle, because if you win on your own without and bypassing the life totals and all that, it's easier for you. And it's kind of unblockable unless someone removes the creature or something, something. But oh, collector's cage. But at the end of the day, your the, the decks will look at oh grindstone. The decks will become more or less the same, which means one of two things. Like the game is not properly designed because if you had access to all the cards, everyone will build pretty much the same deck. And it also shows why Commander exists. Commander exists as a counter maneuver to Wizards' strategy because Wizards' strategy is, understandably so, uh, you need to buy cards and keep buying cards and keep buying cards and keep buying cards and the competitive formats that no one cares about anymore because the prices are... are formats that force you to play with recent cards. So the reason why a lot of people don't play standard is because they need to be on top of the clock, like you need to rebuild your deck every X time, or you need to build X decks and buy a lot of cards. And because of stuff like that is why Commander was born. Commander is, <laughs> Commander is a casual format. In, the, in case that you don't know what Commander is, which will be very weird uh, if you're watching this channel, but Commander, you know, 100 cards, singleton, so 100 unique cards except for lands, basic lands, and that was born as, a, as an answer to that whole strategy, which was, hey, we don't want to buy four copies of each, and the standard cards are no longer legal, so we should use the cards that we have at home. And if you, by law, oh, I've made charm, you can only use one um, copy of each, then problem solved. A lot of the economy problems are solved, but then you have that whole kitchen table feeling that people love about Commander, that is, oh, molten duplication, that is, create a token that's a copy of target artifact or creature you control, except it's an artifact in addition to its other types, it gains haste until the end of turn, sacrifice at the beginning of the next end step. Um, ooh, Grits Gambit, amazing art. Um, an enchantment when Grits Gambit enters the battlefield, you draw three, three cards, gain six life, and create three, two, one, black bat creature tokens with flying. Funny, the bats are also by the same artist. At the beginning of your end step, you discard a card, lose two life, and sacrifice a creature. When Grits Gambit leaves the battlefield, you discard three cards, lose six life, and sacrifice three creatures. So, it is a gambit indeed. Decisive denial, which I don't know if we... No, we don't have a bat yet in the tokens, because I wanted to show you that. But Decisive denial, murder forest and now the normal cards so what happens when you know you just use the cards that you have laying around uh, in your house is that you you get creative and nowadays a lot of the fun of commander is about being creative and a lot of the debates around commander are about uh, feeling good when playing respecting the other players the other players time the other player like not having an overpowered deck because you know you you're playing to pass the time not to be competitive if you want to be competitive for the sake of competition uh bedevil or bedevil uh you should play C cdh and no one cares about that archmage charm again nice savvy trader but if you want your your friends to you know, have a good time commander is weird because it, it doesn't have it has less rules and less restrictions than other formats and however it has more rules because it has a lot of social rules and a lot of those social rules are to avoid feels bad because a commander game can be you know an hour or more and normally you play once a week and you don't want people to feel like they wasted their time right so everyone needs to be on top of the game everyone needs to blah blah, blah. and also the decks need to be more or less balanced and that's where the whole uh, building stuff with the cards you have laying around at home comes from, but also like if you're going to proxy, putting a limit on how much you can proxy because otherwise everyone plays with the same decks, the, 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 the same seven decks from from the meta on on CDH. So, and that's kind of a beauty. So my recommendation to you all uh, watching at home will be like define a monetary value limit because some people are like, okay, if you have one copy of the card. Uh, you can proxy it as many times as you want. And I agree with that. 
uh, because otherwise you need to be keep moving the cards between decks and that's a pain in the ass but also that's kind of pain to win so that means that i still need to buy it from the secondary market and no one cares about about that like you know uh, so the to me the optimal approach is agree on a price limit and share your deck lists before uh, the the friday night magic uh, or the commander night now assuming that no one is a competitive asshole because yes if you share your deck list before the night and someone goes like actually i will play with this deck because it's a counter to that deck that's being kind of an asshole but at the same time that's kind of you know i know what you may be thinking it's like bro i play to relax and you're making this a bureaucratic process it's like, well, yes, to a degree, but it's only to make it easier. Otherwise, you can just say, well, it costs less than 300 bucks and everyone has to believe you. If you have oh, Dust Ball, if you have that um, trust in your group, even better. Um, but if you don't, same, same do twice. Uh, if, you, if you don't, well, uh, any, any Flash the Veteran. <laughs> I was almost reading it as any Flash the Veteran, <laughs> which is like, uh, nope. Um, Essence Capture, not bad. Again, clear shot. And boom. So, if you agree, like, I don't know, 200 bucks sounds like a reasonable amount, you can just add whatever the hell, as long as you are within 300 bucks. And that kind of balances the game a lot and doesn't restrict your creative freedom. Like, if you want to do a deck around, I don't know, uh, around horses with Shadow Facts as your commander, you can. Just don't go over 300 bucks. And you may be thinking, well, if I build my entire deck and it only costs me 50, I still will be at a disadvantage. Like, well, I mean, it's your choice. You, you can't complain. At least it's more or less leveled. But if you build your deck and it's like, I don't know, 50 bucks, you still have 250. You can just, I don't know, go crazy and print a better mana base, which is normally where the money goes anyway. It, no, no kidding. If you put dual lands, which are the lands, you know, the dual lands that have no setbacks, the ones that are uh, very expensive, uh, you, your deck escalates in price crazy fast because we're talking about some of those lands cost a hundred bucks. So, yeah, um, and you know, by having the three hundred uh, bucks uh, limit, you can't add those. Which is actually kind of fun. So recently I had a commander night and I just built a deck to my heart's content. So I didn't look at any limitations and I put the most optimal things in there. And well, it had all the dual lands, etc. So it was a very expensive deck. A lot of that was proxied. Um, and I made a heads up like, yo, this is proxied. It's like, okay, cool. I just want to test it. And I won. It didn't felt very good because it felt cheap. Uh, like I, I cheated my way out of it. And it's because the deck was. This, this art is amazing, by the way. The, the, the deck was so crazily overpowered, and it, it, played, it played with itself. Like, it, you play it alone with that deck, which is not very fun. You're there to play with your friends, right? Uh, oh, nice. Alltech Mat Matter Weaver. Uh, for two and one white. Human Artificer, whenever you cast a creature spell, choose one. Create a 1-1 one, one colorless gnome artifact creature token, or create a token that's a copy of a target artifact you control. This will be a great commander, if not by the fact that they went out of the way to not make it a legendary creature. An amazing art, by the way. Bristlebot Farmer, another one from the big, uh, the big, uh, the big hit, the big ball, I, I forgot the name. The big score? Damn, I forgot the name of the, of the subset. Um, overall, full steam ahead, cool. Um, a giant enemy crab. I think that if you put that simple rule in your group, everything becomes easier and fancier. Because, I mean, this kind of lands, well, this land is kind of whatever, but um, interstabbed and you choose a color. So this is good, right? It's not ultra good, but you know that, that cliche phrase that is like limitation inspires creativity? That's why you need to put some sort of limit uh, and in, in your deck. And you can be like, well, I don't, I'm not overly competitive. So if the deck goes one way, it goes one way. It's like, yes. But if you don't set the rule to the entire group, it becomes unbalanced. And unbalanced is also not fun. So it needs to be somewhere in the middle. Um, 
So you have a limitation, so you have to be creative around it. Plus, you know, a lot of these lands, like Wizards is really trying to do these alternative lands that are, are dual lands, but with, with setbacks. And when the setback is not that bad, like a shock land, that's, there is a reason why shock lands are that expensive. Same card twice. Crazy. And the reason is, well, the setback is not that bad. So it immediately becomes the optimal choice. Now, if you have a price limit on your deck, you need to go with a less cool lens or with a less cool card. And that's great. And yes, again, if for some reason you're like, oh, we want to let's talk with the deck. And if the, the deck, talk, talk to your pod, talk to your group. And if the deck happens to be, you know, 220 bucks and they don't care, it's okay. Um, or if you're like, oh, this week, can we play with 500 box decks? It's like, and everyone agrees, it's okay. Right? Like the, the thing is that everyone agrees because you don't want it's someone to be like, well, you know, I can also win if my deck is super expensive. That's kind of the whole vibe. And again, limitation inspires creativity. So you go with that. Now for the story, because this was supposed to be the story, story video. Outlaws at Thunder Junction doesn't have that much going uh, on it. So um, Ashiok contacts Oko to, to steal something from a vault. And you're like, or still a train, I think it is. No, it's something from a vault. And you're like, okay, like, cool. And he recruits a crew of individuals with specific talents, all villains from Magic the Gathering and multiple planes. So it's like Ocean's Eleven. And that, you know, not that bad. And that's why you have all these cards that have like the wanted posters. All are like, you know, like, I don't know, Tiny Bones, Pickpocket, pickpocket right? And it's like everyone has a talent, even though if the talent is not very logical. And Kellyanne arrives and is like, Papa. And um, Oko is like, I don't care about you, but if you want me to talk to you, you need to help me. So he agrees. You have the story, kind of a basic heist uh, story, not much going around. Now, the crazy thing and this is what I wanted to focus about the story, is the end. So Ashiok, for some reason, asked for that, and turns out it wasn't Ashiok. And Vraska is there as well. Vraska is one of the members of the crew, and you're like, Vraska? Like, what? Did, wasn't Vraska all Firectionized? Like, what's up with that? Because if you remember, and if you don't, we'll watch the bundle for Firexion will be one, and we'll open one again once we go back in the saga of the bundles, but... Um, if you don't remember, um, you had that card, Firexion Arena, which is basically Vraska. Ooh, Mind Slayer. Uh, Mind Slaver. Uh, which is basically Vraska killing Jace, and, you know, Jace becomes a Firexion. Uh, let me see. Six. One, uh, oof, six. You pay four, tap it, and sacrifice it. You control the target player during that player's next turn. Okay, that's that explains the cost. Um, ooh. A crime and punishment. Put target creature or enchantment card from opponent graveyard onto the battlefield under your control and destroy each artifact. Uh, destroy each artifact creature and enchantment with mana value X. Now, with these cards, th these are two pieces of art, all from the same artist. I do wonder, was he paid as two different cards? Because it's two different pieces of art, even though they are smaller. Um... I do wonder. We ride at dawn from the commander decks. See, there you go. Breaches the blast maker. So all of the, the dudes in the crew have um, a wanted poster like this. Ooh, final showdown. It's the final showdown in foil. So for one plus, because it has spree, which is a mechanic that everyone has been melting around, um, you pay one white and one colorless, all creatures lose all abilities until the end of turn. You pay an, uh, a, any color, or generic as they call it, choose a creature you control, it gains indestructible at the end of turn, and if you pay three and two white, destroy all creatures. So if you pay all that, a, a creature that you have is indestructible, so it doesn't get destroyed, and everyone loses abilities. So technically, uh, you can you can have the loses all abilities so that they dis they lose the indestructible so you can wipe them so this is very good no no wonder this thing is expensive heartless pillage turns out that at the end of the story because Vraska was Firexionized and if you remember if you're watching this channel for since 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 we started with Firexia and all that 
Um, I've been wondering what happened with Jace and I mean, and Vraska, I guess, because Vraska was just like, she just disappeared. But everyone was like, what happened with Jace? Because Nisa and Ajani were cured uh, because of this lady that was immune. She died so they could leave because no one cared about Alara, was the name? No, I don't remember. You know, the lady that was immune to the oil. So she died so that the planeswalkers may be alive, but they lost their spark. So they are no longer planeswalkers. And Jace just disappeared. And I've been saying like, oh, Jace will appear in... Uh, ooh, Endless Detour. Like, Jace will appear in... Uh, what's the name of the... Uh, an Ixalan, because he loved Ixalan, so I guess he will be there. But he wasn't, which is weird, because I thought that was the perfect reason for having Ixalan in the roadmap, right? And and to change in that plane to Ixalan, because that plane wasn't supposed to be Ixalan, they changed it. Um, to Ixalan. That's why it feels weird. It's all caves and stuff like that. So, turns out that Vraska is alive because Jace is alive. So, it wasn't Ashiok. It was Jace all along. And Jace, this guy says Ashiok, was ordering for this because they, they want to fix the multiverse. And Jace is fixed because he went back to his mom and his mom fixed him with a phoenix feather. Which is like, what is this? Final Fantasy? Like, okay. And then he comes back with Vraska and goes like, Mom, can you fix my girlfriend, please? And she fixes him as well. Like, mind you, we don't know even the name of the mother. It's just the mother of Jace. And Jace says, Mom, like, okay. And then he's like, oh, we need to fix the multiverse because of the, of the Omen pads. This thing is crazy. Now, all evil can travel between planes, which is funny because he's saying that. And in Thunder Junction, which is according to Mark Rosewater, the villain set, which is not, this is the cowboy one, but whatever. If it's the villain set, because it's all villains, then what Jace did was bringing all villains to Thunder Junction. So he knows how this thing works. So he's saying like, oh, everything that we did with the Gatewatch and all that won't be for good. So they opened the vault and there is this thing called loot in there, which is like a fox tanuki thing i don't know and that's the key to everything and i don't know so apparently the story now is like okay kellyan whatever kellyan is going to explore with amalia benavides aguirre so like whatever no one cares and now the story is about jace trying to close the omen paths so it's jace and vraska with loot so it's they are like the team rocket or something and he wants to solve this by any means necessary so that's interesting by the way i'm going to so sort these by best looking while i talk uh so it's interesting because Jace, if they do it properly, Jace may be having, or may, yeah, a, a villain arc or something like a villain arc, like a Thanos arc, which to me is funny that they just keep copying Marvel. Like, it's not like Marvel is the most original thing, but like, come on, really? So Jace is going like, no, we're going to close this by any means. And it's like, well, if they do this properly and Jace becomes a villain, that is interesting, right? Like, uh, Jace against everyone else. <laughs> Man, Adrian, let's go. Because, um, you know, people saying like, Jace, you can't do this because it's going to kill a lot of people and blah, 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 and a lot of economies. And blah. and Jace being like, nope, we need to control who play who travels between planes. And maybe they, they recover Killian, which I don't think they recover Killian because no one cares about Killian, but maybe they recover Killian. And they... And Kellyan is like, no, if you if you fix that, I will never find my father. He's like, well, what good did it do to you? You you saw your dad. Your dad was like, I don't care about you. And you're like, okay, I'm going to explore the multiverse with uh, Amalia Benavides Aguirre, which, okay, bro, like, what's up with that? But if they do it properly, which I don't, I'm not sure they're going to do it. I have I have faith, but if they do it properly. Jace may be like an anti anti hero. Like everyone will be like, Jace, no, stop it. And he will be like, nope, we need to close this by any means necessary. I don't care. I'm fighting against all allies and stuff like that. And maybe they misunderstanding his motives, which that would be lazy. I would prefer if they don't misunderstand his motives. Like he explains it and they go like, hmm, okay, that makes sense. And some of them join and some of them still go like, no, you can't do this. You can take, you, you can't play God, you know, that sort of thing. And he will be like, no, Elish Norn playing God uh, and look at what, look what it brought to us, right? And that's actually a good debate, which I don't think they're going to pull. I am, I'm just doing, um, 
uh, fan fix over here uh, because I am one of the 10 people in the world that care about Magic the Gathering lore and history. Apparently, according to uh, Mark Rosewater, no one cares about the story of Magic the Gathering and even the, the, the universes within things. So that's why they only do universes beyond. And they are not going to do universes within versions of the universes beyond. They, you know, because we don't care. Which is like, Mark, come on. Can you let, can you please let Gavin take over? Like, come on, Mark. Um, to be fair, uh, even if, because we all have Gavin as this messiah figure, I mean, he's a nice guy for sure. And he designed one of the best pre-cons ever, which is Timey Wimey. Forever love to that guy. Uh, and he introduced, he made me watch Doctor Who because of the thing. I was like, oh man, this, this thing slaps. Let me, let me watch the series. And now I'm a fan of Doctor Who. So Gavin, if you're listening, thank you. Um, and we need more people like Gavin. Like he's very close to the community and, you know, no barriers there. And he just says what it is. But again, we all need to remember. Gavin may be great. Mark Rosewater, sometimes, may be great. But you can tell that Mark, a lot of times, has to play devil's advocate because it's a business. So if the CEO or you know the business says, like, oh, but we need to sell this, Mark Rosewater is going to be like, yay! Right, guys? Yay! And, you know, even if... Yeah. So it is what it is. It's a business, after all. But in the meantime, this is what we pull... Let me know down below and let me know what you thought about the story of Thunder Junction and if you care more about universes within or universes beyond. Um, anyway, thanks for watching and I hope to see you next time on Packs and Recreation. Bye!